We're in a series called The Spirit-Filled Life, and today we're going to talk about prophecy in Scripture. And I've got my sweetie up here again today because, uh, as I did a couple weeks ago, because we're going to cover a lot of Scripture. So grab a note card or a smartphone or something that you can take some notes on. This will be posted. I think it'll be up uh, where you can view it again online by Tuesday morning or, uh, but, uh, We want to just rest everything that we believe, all of our practice, upon the word of the Lord. So let's pray. Father, God, as we open your word, I pray, open our hearts right now. Holy Spirit, you're the author, you're the real teacher, and I pray as they hear mine and Tammy's voice, Lord, more importantly, they hear the voice of the Lord, Father. God, I thank you, God, your word will never return void. So, Father, as it goes forth, Lord, I just pray that you would give spirit of revelation, Lord, Father, that you would, Lord, let faith be released to embrace and, God, to appropriate the word of the Lord, Father, each person in here, God, to make it real in their life. God, we bind every hindering spirit. We know the enemy does not want us to hear about Jesus. He does not want us to hear about the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. So we bind, God, every hindrance, God, whether it's personal, Lord, Father, a child, Lord, technical, anything. We take authority over it, Lord. Jesus, you said whatever we bind on earth is bound in the spirit realm, God, and we just loose, God, that spirit of revelation and understanding, Lord, Father, and insight, God, as Paul told us to pray for our Lord, Father, and we loose that, and we thank you in Jesus' name. And again, everybody said, you know, our God is a loving Heavenly Father, and he always desires to speak to us, his children. Now, some of the main ways, there are many, many ways that God speaks to us, but some of the main ways that God speaks to us today are through the Bible, God's Word. It gives us wisdom. That's why you're always hearing us encourage you, read the Word of God. Make it your daily bread. He also speaks through the inner voice of the Holy Spirit, that still, small voice. Now, sometimes I wish it wasn't so still and so small. Sometimes I can be a knucklehead. I wish God would shout at me, but he doesn't do that. He speaks to all of us in that still, small voice because he wants us to learn to be sensitive to his inner voice that lives in all of us as believers. Another way he speaks is through uh, other people, through the preaching and teaching of God's word, like he's using Tammy and I now, through teaching in small groups, through relationships and relationships that you would form in small groups. That's why we're always encouraging you about that. We need to have good, godly Christian friends who love us enough to speak into our lives. And another way he speaks is through the spiritual gifts. And two of them we're going to look at today are prophecy and tongues. Now, why? Those are a bit mysterious. Why would God um, want to speak to us that way? Well, if you'll think about it, I don't want a God that's like me. How about you? He wouldn't, that wouldn't be a God at all, would it? In, In Isaiah 55, there's an important prophecy. And Isaiah says, the Lord's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are so much higher, and his ways are so much higher, so much beyond our ways. But, you know, he wants us to understand his ways that sometimes seem mysterious to our educated, analytical mind. But he wants us to understand his ways, and some of those spiritual ways is through the gifts of prophecy and tongues. I've heard Christians say, and I was even taught this younger, and... and, um, in earlier in my education, all the revelation we need to live the Christian life is found in the Bible. And I get it. People are trying to honor and lift up the word of the Lord. But you know, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible encourages us to desire and to use the spiritual gifts. It even puts a lot of emphasis on the two most controversial gifts, prophecy and speaking in tongues. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 39. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. You know, just because some people misuse the gifts or I've even seen people abuse the spiritual gifts, that does not give us the right to reject them. 
Do you hear me? Just because some people misuse them does not give us the right to be overreactionary and say, ah, oh, I don't want anything to do with that. Uh, that both of those are wrong. Both of those. First Thessalonians five verse nineteen says, "Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things and hold fast what is good." So let's look at that. Do not quench the spirit. Quench means to lessen, to decrease, to diminish. So let's make sure that we don't lessen or dampen or diminish the moving of the Spirit of God in our lives or in a gathering or in a corporate service. Do not despise prophecy. To despise means to scorn, to, to look down upon, to say, oh, that's not, I don't want anything to do with that. That doesn't interest me. Listen, it interested God. It should interest us too. And then he says, test all things. To test means to evaluate. And it means, re the implication is this. Test all things, reject the bad, reject that and what doesn't line up to the word of God, but embrace and hold on to that which is good, that which is godly. But so many times I see people just rejecting it all because they don't want to wade into the waters of evaluation and they don't want to exercise uh, maturity and discernment that way. But it is, again, it's wrong to misuse the gifts, but it's also wrong to reject the gifts because, ah, I just don't want to go there. That's like, you know, everything that's valuable is counterfeited. And just because there's a lot of counterfeit $100 bills, it doesn't diminish the value of a real $100 bill, does it? And it just proves the, the worth and the value of that which is real, the enemy that would want to counterfeit it or, or distort it or, or cause people to misuse it. So let's see what the Bible has to say about the prophetic. The Bible actually talks about four spears of prophecy. You might want to write these down in, in the scriptures that go with them. The Bible is the highest form of communication that we have from God. Second Peter um, chapter 1, verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. You know, that's just saying that God's Word, and that's what we believe here at Hope Church, that God's Word is infallible, it doesn't fail, and it's in inerrant. It means it doesn't have any errors in it. So not only is there the prophecy of Scripture, there's the office of a prophet. That's the second spear of prophecy. It's the five-fold office. Today, God uses prophets mainly as guides to help guide us as the body of Christ. You see, in the Old Testament, the office of prophet was the primary gift that God spoke through. But now on this side of the cross, in the New Testament, the office of apostle has actually superseded the office of the prophet. And uh, there was not, never even an office of an apostle talked about in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, it, it did. And it supersedes that as the primary gift that God uses. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. God has appointed these in the church. First, apostles. Second, prophets. Third, teachers. After that, gifts of healings, helps, administrations, and very varieties of tongues. Wow, isn't that something? There are a lot of spiritual gifts. There are 12 named in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And, uh, and then there's also a list of them in Romans 12. And these that were, uh, that Tammy just read, but it talks about apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers in Ephesians 4. Now, of all that, apostles first, prophets second, teachers, then after that, gifts of healing. Why? We know because people are vulnerable. We always need to be praying for healing on people's bodies, but then helps in administrations. That's what you see going on pre-service and around. Hey, that's what ushers and, and, and greeters and all that, that's listed right here. God elevates those areas of service very high. That's a gift of helps and administration, the people that administrate and line all this up during the week that, that we go by, and then varieties of tongues. I want you to see these things deserve special mention, okay, and uh, in the foundation of the early church. Old Testament prophets, they confronted sin they warned of coming judgment if there wasn't repentance. They corrected, they directed, and even gave 
hope. But New Testament prophets don't operate like that. They don't confront sin. They don't warn of judgment or, or correct or direct our lives. But they do something else. They, they give hope. They encourage. We're about to read about that. And they comfort. And they build up. And they bless. And all those things. Why don't they do those other corrective things? Because now, this side of the cross, we have the Holy Spirit leading in, living in us. And Jesus, when he talked about the Holy Spirit, the first thing he said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict you of sin, of righteousness, and of a soon coming judgment. So we don't need the voice of a person convicting us now. It's that inner voice and dealing of the Holy Spirit that brings us to conviction and leads us to repentance. So there's a bit of a change in the way that the prophet operates from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Third, there's a gift of prophecy. This is a spiritual gift that's given to some believers, not all. Prophecy is a spiritual gift, and it must be used. It must be developed. It's a gift. It's not a mark of maturity. And the gift of prophets, prophecy is given to certain people to enable them to bring a word of the Lord to, the, to a church or to a person in order to strengthen, encourage, and comfort. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. But so desire these, all right? Well, desire yeah. these spiritual gifts. But especially that you may prophesy. Because he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to us. So we need both God's written word, the Logos. That's the entirety of the Bible is called the Logos. But we also need the prophetic word, the rhema. A prophetic word is called a rhema. And it's like this. I just open my, I've got this all over. I write when the Holy Spirit impresses me. I've got, if you can get a close up, can you get a close up on that? Wherever we are, get a tight shot here. You, you might can see some, some yellow there, highlight. And I think that's what the prophetic word, it's a word out of the Logos that the Holy Spirit kind of highlights in our life. It causes, like Pastor Rich said in the announcement earlier explaining the presbytery that's coming in this weekend, it, he, he highlights it. It kind of jumps off the page and it becomes a personal word applied by the Holy Spirit to our life. So where am I? Number four, all right. This is the last one. So we have, uh, we have the prophecy of Scripture. We've got the office of a prophet. We've got the gift of prophecy. And then there's a spirit of prophecy. This is where an environment uh, is kind of set that is conducive for the prophetic to operate. It's when the Holy Spirit enables Christians who do not have the gift of prophecy or are not in the office of a prophet to speak prophetically. First Samuel 10, uh, we, I mean, yes, First Samuel 10, we see that King Saul, who was not a particularly godly guy, all right, he, he was the king of Israel, but uh, he kind of went astray. And, but one time, even when he was go had gone away from the Lord in his life, he got around Samuel's company of prophets, and it said the spirit of prophecy came upon him, and he spoke the word of the Lord when he wasn't even living for the Lord. And he, because that environment so kind of permeated him, that's a spirit of prophecy. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 31 says this, You can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and be encouraged. That means we can learn how to do that and we can encourage, be encouraged. Prophecy is to encourage us, not to discourage us, it's to encourage us. So why is this possible? See, how is it, it says you can all prophesy. How could all of us prophesy? It's because of what happened on the day of Pentecost at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2 verse 17. In the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Now, Peter was quoting, this is an Old Testament prophecy from Joel that he was quoting to them. So we have seen that prophetic ministry is biblical. It's very important because God doesn't give us any unimportant gifts. So it's biblical. It's important. It's very needed, and it's very impactful in our life today. And that's one of the reasons we're bringing in a prophetic team this coming weekend to stir up and to elevate the prophetic in Hope Church. Now, let's, we've looked at prophecy. Now, let's switch gears, and let's look at, at tongues, the gift of tongues, okay? Could I ask you to do this? Set aside kind of what you have thought uh, previously, and let's just actually look and see 
what the Bible says. Most Christians come from backgrounds where spiritual gifts were either not used or where the spiritual gifts were misused. Can I tell you again, both are wrong. Get out of the ditches, all right? Uh, one ditch is to misuse them. The other ditch is not to use them, all right? Both, I believe, grieve the Spirit of God. Both are wrong in the sight of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1 says, Concerning spiritual gifts, I do not want you to be ignorant, or he means I don't want you to be uninformed or unaware of them. So why does Satan work so hard to create confusion and misunderstanding about the Holy Spirit and about the gifts. Think about it. Why, does, why is it that there's so much misunderstanding, confusion, and controversy swirling around the person and work and ministry of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Well, if you'll think it's because, it's very simple, because Jesus said that when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, and he, he said that he would baptize us, you'll receive power. All right, and you'll be witnesses. You'll be you'll you'll have the supernatural power of God operating in your life. Well, the enemy wants to create confusion because he doesn't want us empowered by the Spirit of God. And not only is he a supernatural God, he gave us supernatural gifts, and that's why those gifts sometimes they offend our mind. I remember, boy, when I was because I came from a denominational background, and it was actually offensive to my mind to everything that I had been taught. And I realized the Lord had teach me. That that I'd made my education and my theological training an idol. And I had to get that idol of my education off my mind. And the Spirit of God many times will offend your mind, okay, to cause you to embrace the things that you can't fully understand, but you have to step into by faith. Without faith, the Bible says, it is impossible to please the Lord. So, that's the way Satan works. And in both the early church, and we're going to read, Tammy's going to read a scripture now, and today, it's common for people to come to salvation, to receive Jesus Christ, and never be told about their need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit for power or for the release of the gifts in their life. It's found in Acts 19, it starts at verse 2. And Paul's talking to the Christians there at Corinth, and he says, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, well, we have not so much as even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues, and they prophesied. So it just shows here that when they received the Holy Spirit, then they began to operate in spiritual gifts. And notice one of the things that's important for the ministry, for people to receive Holy Spirit, they laid hands on them. It's important sometimes for people. It's not always necessary, but uh, it was for me. I had to have somebody lay hands on me, all right, because I had a lot I had to work through, all right? So the Bible actually, now follow me, please. The Bible actually talks about two different types of tongues. It talks about speaking in tongues or giving a message in tongues, and it talks about praying in tongues. One of the reasons there is so much misunderstanding and confusion about tongues is because most Christians, most churches, most denominations lump them all into one bucket. They lump them together. But the Bible doesn't do that, and we shouldn't do that either. There are clearly two different types of tongues, and there are clear biblical guidelines or spiritual protocols that would go with each type of tongues. But if we lump them all together, then we'll apply the wrong guidelines or wrong protocol to those tongues. And we'll say, oh, that's out of order. That's not God when it actually is the Lord. So Paul wrote, it's interesting to know, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians as a corrective letter because the spiritual gifts, especially prophecy and tongues, were being misused during corporate church services. So let's look at the two types of tongues. First one, I'm going to deal with the most common one, okay? Praying in tongues. This is the most common. Every Christian can, every Christian should do this, and it does not need to be interpreted. It does not need to be interpreted. Why? Because this type of tongue is a personal, it's a devotional prayer language. 
The believer is praying in tongues, praying in the Spirit to God. They're not speaking a message to people. They're praying in the Spirit to the Lord, okay? It's for, the, we're gonna, Tammy's going to read just a second. It's for personal edification. The more we pray in tongues, Tammy and I do that all the time. In our home, we were doing it this morning on the ride here. We were praying in the Spirit. Why? Because we were building ourselves up. We were edifying ourselves. And, but it's, so that's important, okay? And when we're doing that, there's no interpretation required. It's found in 1 Corinthians, it's chapter 14, it starts in verse 2. He, or you can say she, who speaks in tongues does not speak to, to men or to people, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. But he who prophesies edifies the church. And then uh, down in verse 14 of the same chapter, it says, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding or my, my mind is unfruitful. Now, remember, Paul's a smart man. He's very educated. So then he begins to ask himself. He said, so what is the conclusion then? I mean, should I pray in the spirit? Um, or should I pray in the, in the, in with my understanding? And he says, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray with the Spirit, and I'll also pray with understanding. I'll also be able to hear myself in, in my mind, in my own language. And I'm going to sing with the Spirit, and I'll also sing with the understanding with my mind. You see, when we pray in English, now follow me. We all know this. When we pray in English, we pray from our, from our human understanding or revelation we pray with our mind we pray with our intellect but we also pray with limitations we get tired we run out of what things to pray about we run out of time out of yeah to things to say or we we pray from our insight or we pray sometimes come on let's be real selfishly from our own selfish desires don't we but when we pray in tongues, when we pray in the Spirit, we're praying, the Bible says, the divine mysteries of God. We're praying, it says in other places, the perfect will of God. And here's a biggie. And the enemy can't understand you. Why? It's the, it's the tongues of men and the tongues of angels. That's what a prayer language is. It's a heavenly language that's spoken in, in heaven by the angels, and the enemy can't understand us. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 18 says, I thank my God that I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding and with my mind than I may teach others also rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. So why did Paul pray in tongues so much? Think about it. Why did he do it so much? I mean, one of the most educated men we have. God used him to write a majority of the New Testament scriptures. Why did he? You see why he had the battle earlier when Tammy read that scripture? He says, you know, when, when I pray in, in the spirit, my mind, my understanding is unfruitful. What, what's the conclusion? What should I, should I do something that I, as an educated guy, don't even understand what I'm doing? And then he, that's when he says, I will pray with the spirit. I will sing in the spirit so why is he doing that it's an important question okay why does why does paul pray in tongues so much he's doing it to keep himself built up i've heard some christians actually say you know i really pastor i don't have a desire to pray in the spirit and i think that's sad that's really sad what you're saying is you really don't have a desire to build yourself up to be strong spiritually. You really don't have a desire to build and stir up your faith. Come on, really? And you're you're committed child of God, and God laid his all down for you, and you don't even desire the things of God? Listen. This is found in Jude, verse 20. Beloved, build yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. See, it wasn't just a suggestion. Maybe you should do this. He was saying, he was, it was really a command. He said, build yourself up, and how you're going to build yourself up is to pray in the Holy Spirit. A couple of Sundays ago when we had the uh, succession service, we brought in Bishop Miller and Pastor Lonnie. Um, see, each church kind of has a protocol and, and what is their, their style too. But they're all be under biblical guidelines. But before Pastor Lonnie prophesied in that situation, he prayed in tongues on the mic 
And yeah, I had people say, well, he prayed, uh, he spoke in tongues and it wasn't interpreted. And, and, just to, and I just knew, I got to do this message, okay? <laughs> I mean, he wasn't speaking a message in tongues. He was doing Jude 20. Pray in the Holy Spirit and you stir yourself up. I do it all the time. Tenny does it all the time. Before we minister to people, you, you'll hear a lot of people at our altar. Before they will minister to you or pray for you, they pray in the Spirit because it's like a primer. It stirs you up. Tongues is a gateway gift, all right? And that's why it's usually one of the first gifts that people get when they're baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's a gateway. I liken it to this. I grew up on a farm, all right, real poor, and we had a a, a pump out back and we had a big bucket of water and there was a mason jar and that pump would go dry we dip the water uh, the jar in the big bucket and you would do what to the pump come on some of you are old enough you remind, remember may not been you it's probably your grandparents or something like that somebody you knew right and you would do what to the pump you'd prime the pump you see, that's what praying in the Holy Spirit does. It primes the pump. It gets the water of the Holy Spirit flowing and moving in your life. That's why it's crazy, it's silly, it's unbiblical to say, oh, I don't want anything to do with that. Well, listen, do anything, do everything you can to make yourself strong spiritually, to keep your faith stirred up. Amen? Y'all got me stirred up, all right? All right, I'm good. <laughs> all right, so... Praying in the spirits. First, I got to hurry. All right, second type of tongues is speaking a message in tongues, usually in a corporate gathering, all right? Uh, this is a spiritual gift. It's rarely used today. We don't say, it's usually used in environments where there are a lot of unbelievers or cross-cultural settings. And if a message in tongues is given publicly during a church service, there must be an interpretation so those present can be edified. Again, it's not common today like praying in tongues is. That's very common. This is more uncommon. But 1 Corinthians 14, verse 5. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless he interprets that the church may receive edification. So what's the heart of Paul, this great apostle, this great church planter, this great theologian? His heart is the heart of God. God wants everything done to build us up, to edify us. That's why he would say prophecy is more desirable in a church service than tongues unless, okay, so what is prophecy? It's speaking the word of the Lord in our known language, all right? We have prophecy a lot around here, all right, and, and, and uh so it's speaking in a non-language, the word of the Lord. But tongues is speaking in a heavenly language. But when it's interpreted in our language of English, then it's equal to prophecy because tongues plus interpretation would also edify and build up the church. Does that make sense? It kind of puts it on par with prophecy, which uh, is is greater gift, it says, because it edifies. 1 Corinthians 14, 27 says, For if anyone speaks in a tongue, and he's talking about in the church, let there be two or at the most three, each in turn and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church and let him speak to himself and to God. So, you know, this, here's an interesting point. Now, I didn't even have this in the notes. The Holy Spirit doesn't force you to do anything. You know, some Christians got the gift of giving, but, you know, the Holy Spirit didn't cause your wallet to come out of your back pocket this morning or your checkbook float out of your purse, did it, and force you to give. You choose to use the gifts. So that's what he's saying here. You, you choose to use these gifts. If you have this gift and you know the, the atmosphere or the environment's not right, don't use it, all right? <laughs> don't use it is what he's saying. Here are the guidelines for giving a message in tongues during a church service or gathering or, or a corporate gathering of believers, okay? Only one person may give a message in tongues at a time. Why? Because God says do all things decently in order, and it must be interpreted. This is the one that must be interpreted when it comes forth in a church service as a message from the Lord. No more than two or three may give a message in tongues in any particular service, and again, it has to be interpreted. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 22. Tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. 
So let's go back again to the day of Pentecost, all right, where tongues was spoken in, by those 120 gathered in the upper rooms. What kind of tongues was that? It was a message in tongues. Why? Because it was a sign to unbelievers. Acts 2 verse 4 says, They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues or other languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance. When this sound occurred, the multitude came together, and they were confused because... Everyone heard them speak in his own earthly language. And they said, how is that that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? So imagine that. So the 120 in the upper room, they're, they're doing what Jesus commanded them to do. They're praying and they're waiting. He says, don't leave here until you're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. The King James would say, until you're endued with power from on high. Well, that happened. The Holy Spirit was poured out, and they wondered what was happening. And that's when Peter quoted Joel, and he said, you know, the Holy Spirit's poured out. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. And it was a great outpouring of the, of the Holy Spirit. And so these, they began to speak with tongues. What they were speaking is other languages, unknown to them as, as, as speakers, they never studied these languages. They would never learned, had no proficiency of these languages. But these languages were known. And it lists about seven different nations of people were in Acts chapter 2. So, see, that's the miracle. They were speaking in languages they didn't know. No interpretation was needed. Why? Because the hearers understood what was said in their native tongue in which they were born. Now, I've read testimonies, and probably you have too, of Christians who spoke in a tongue or a foreign language on the missions field or sharing with uh, somebody that was not a believer. That They had never learned that language. They'd never studied that language. But somehow the hearers understood in their native language. This is tongues as a sign to unbeliever, and it's often used in mission context or for evangelism is, is used. So... Let's kind of wrap it up. 1 Corinthians 13, we didn't go there. Verse 1 says, though I speak to you with the tongue of men, that would be this, Acts chapter 2, or the tongue of angels, that would be what we looked at in 1 Corinthians 14. So two different types of tongues. And he said, I have not love, then whatever I speak is just a, just a clanging symbol, and God doesn't really honor it. Okay? So we're to be moved by love. Bottom line. Here's what's most important. Here's what I want you to walk away with. Bottom line, God's good. God is good. And he does not give any bad or any unnecessary gifts to any of us. God is good, and any gift he gives us is a good gift because he's a good God. And it's got a purpose, and it benefits us, and it benefits others. So who can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? Remember? Jesus is God's gift to the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So Jesus is God's gift to the world. But the Holy Spirit is God's gift to his church, to his family. Every believer can and every believer should receive the fullness or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Luke eleven thirteen 13 says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, well, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him?